All right, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we've got our presentation on heat stress and the OSHA, OSHA's emphasis program. First, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, as usual, this is gonna be a slideshow presentation, uh, so you can kind of follow along the conversation. Uh, at the end, we'll have a question and answer period. So throughout the presentation, anytime you come up with questions, uh, there's a question function on the on the bar on the side. You can enter your question and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, after today's live presentation, the, it's the presentation will be recorded and it'll be available anytime at societyinsurance.com under the risk management and education and training tab. Uh, you can also find it on Society Insurance's YouTube channel. So if you want to show it to other employees or, or coworkers, whatever, you can direct them to that. Uh, we are coming to you live from four different states from our home offices, so if we have any kind of little technical glitches or audio glitches, uh, please excuse those. I also have a chihuahua that likes to create his own glitches for me, so he might introduce himself at some point, but we'll see. Before we begin, just a quick little overview of society insurance. Uh, we're a regional insurance carrier that's based in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, uh, but we do currently write business in nine states. We have uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Tennessee, Colorado, Georgia, and most recently, Texas. Um, we've been writing workers' comp coverage since 1915, but today we also have property, liability, commercial auto, uh, cyber coverage. Uh, we really focus on the hospitality industry. Uh, so we provide uh, business insurance for the niche of the hospitality in industry, uh, and we kind of focus on the small details that make the big difference. Today, uh, we've got three presenters besides myself. My name is Shelby Blundell. I'm a risk improvement rep, been with Society Insurance for 13 years. I cover kind of the northern uh, Illinois area based out of the Chicago area. Uh, we also have Adam. You want to say hi? Hey, everybody. Uh, as Shelby said, I'm Adam Olenek. I'm a senior risk control representative for Society Insurance. Um, I've been in risk control for nine years now, and then seven with Society specifically. I'm a certified safety professional, and then uh, my territory includes the eastern half of the state of Wisconsin. And then I assist in Texas and Iowa as well as needed. Awesome. Then we got and Jay we Vendersen. A Got to take it off mute, Jay. <laughs> Hello, sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Um, I've been with Society for 23 years, and uh, my territory is the northeastern part of the uh, state of Wisconsin. Awesome. And then Greg Bailey? The best for last. I'm Greg. I've been with Society for five years. My territory consists of Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. Awesome. We can always count on Jay to be our first technical glitch. Thank you. Quick disclaimer, let you read it. Uh, as with everything these days, you got to have a little disclaimer. We will have three learning objectives today. Uh, what is heat stress and why is it important? How does OSHA's heat stress emphasis program affect my company? And how does my company help keep its employees safe from heat stress? good information and right now with the weather it's very applicable what we're going to do is going to start just by getting everybody thinking just a little bit and ask a question everybody has a chance to answer how many workers were killed or injured from heat stress from 1992 to 2017 200 killed and 20,000 injured 350 killed, 32,000 injured, 110 killed, 34,000 injured, 815 killed, 70,000 injured. Just a second here for everybody to get a chance to weigh in. Okay, got most of the people have answered. It looks like most of them are leaning toward 
answer B? What is it, Adam? What's your answer on that? Uh, so the correct answer is actually B. I don't blame you if you pick B because that you know they had the 100, 200, 300 categories, but then 800. Um, but it actually is B. Um, so according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, heat stress killed 815 uh, U.S. workers and then seriously injured more than 70,000 workers from 1992 to 2007. Um, however, this is likely a, a vast underestimate given that injuries and illnesses are underreported in the U.S., especially in sectors employing vulnerable and often undocumented workers. Um, so furthermore, heat is not always recognized as a cause of heat-induced injuries or deaths and can easily be misclassified because many of the symptoms overlap with many more common diagnoses. So. So first off, what is heat stress? Um, heat stress is a general term used to describe heat generated illnesses that result when the body is unable to cool itself off through sweating. We'll end up going through specific examples of heat stress later on in this presentation as well. <clears throat> Many various industries can be affected by heat stress. So according to the National Institute for Occupational Health, Safety and Health, uh, workers at Risk of heat stress include outdoor workers, workers in hot environments, such as firefighters, bakery workers, farmers, construction workers, miners, boiler room workers, factory workers, and many others. So why is heat stress important? Um, heat is the leading weather-related killer. Um, it's becoming more dangerous as 18 of the last 19 years were the hottest on record. Excessive heat can cause heat illnesses and even death if not treated properly. It also exacerbates existing health problems like asthma, kidney failure, and heart disease. Workers in the agricultural and uh, construction industries are the highest at risk for getting heat illnesses, but the problem affects all workers exposed to heat, including indoor workers without climate-controlled environments. <clears throat> so what is OSHA doing about heat-related illness prevention, and why have they formed the National Emphasis Program? So overall, OSHA heat-related inspections have accounted for only a half of a percentage point of all federal inspections during the last five years, and that includes both unprogrammed 75% and programmed 25% inspections. The number of the unprogrammed activities makes it, un makes it clear that the continued need for heat-related outreach and compliance assistance activities as well as on-site consultation visits and programmed enforcement is needed by OSHA to lower reported fatalities, hospitalizations, and complaints or referrals to OSHA. Um, so overall, the goal of this national emphasis program is to reduce or eliminate worker exposures to heat-related hazards that have resulted in illnesses, injuries, and deaths by targeting industries and work sites, including work sites with radiant heat sources, where employees are exposed to heat-related hazards and have not been provided with adequate protection. That includes cool water, rest, cool areas, training, and proper acclimatization. These mitigation strategies are key in controlling health hazards associated with heat exposures. OSHA's goal will be accomplished by a combination of enforcement, which includes inspection targeting, and then outreach to employers and compliance assistance. Each region is actually expected to have a physical year goal of increasing their heat inspections by 100% above the baseline of the average of the fiscal years 2017 through 2021. So in a nutshell, inspections will be increasing due to the National Emphasis Program to help boost injury and illness prevention. So when will OSHA program inspections take place? OSHA will be using the heat index for inspection days. OSHA will potentially conduct random inspections when a heat priority day occurs. So a heat priority day occurs when the heat index for the day is expected to be at 80 degrees or higher. So why is OSHA's marker at 80 degrees? When the heat index is 80 degrees or higher, serious occupational heat related illnesses and injuries become more frequent, especially in workplaces where unacclimatized workers are performing strenuous work, such as intense 
arm and back, lifting work, carrying, digging, manual sawing, pushing and pulling heavy loads without easy access to cool water or cool and shaded areas. When working in direct sunlight or areas where other radiant heat sources are present, heat-related fatalities are usually the result of extortional heat stroke or physical activity in hot environments causes the body temperature to reach 104 degrees. So just for reference, your normal body temperature is about 98.6, so it's about roughly six degrees higher. Um, this means OSHA's certified safety and health officers will most likely inquire about how a company is tracking the heat and what their policies are during these hot day inspections. Foreground inspections will occur on any day that the National Weather Service has announced a heat warning or advisory for the local area. So it's very important to make sure workers are well taken care of when that temperature is at or over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And just to make sure that the business is tracking day-to-day -day temperature fluctuations. So for this slide, in all honesty, if you're an employer with 10 or more employees, I would be extra cautious. They'll be looking at more obvious places of employment where heat stress seems to affect that industry type more than others. However, if there have been past reports of heat stress related incidents on your OSHA 300 logs or your industry as a potential acclimatization factor, I would definitely be more vigilant of heat related issues. So what are the requirements from OSHA's national emphasis program? Um, the requirements for the OSHA emphasis program are training, PPE, um, engineering, administrative controls, health screenings, um, and then establishing a heat alert program. So one of our speakers, Greg, will actually go into more details about these items specifically further in the PowerPoint. Um, I will, however, list a few standards that OSHA could use to enforce during this National Emphasis Program. Um, so they could pull from sanitation standards that are found in like the 29 uh, Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, 1915, 1917, 1918, and 1928. Basically, all these standards require employees, employers to provide portable, potable water, so like aka safe drinking water, for the employees or to make sure that the employees have access to such water. They could also pull from the general industry standard or construction standards, so like 1910 and uh, which have requirements for making sure uh, there are safety and health programs established, as well as frequent and regular safety and health inspections done for job sites to make sure the employees have a safe work environment, which includes rest and water, et cetera. If you guys want more specific codes too, you can feel free to email us. Uh, a newer way to keep up with tracking the heat and learning if the day will be a heat priority day is to use the actual OSHA or NIOSH's new app. Um, it can give the heat index information right on the app. It can also be screenshot for record keeping purposes as well. Um, it can give reminders about drinking fluids, scheduling rest break, breaks, etc. Um, another cool feature is the app is available in both English and Spanish for Android and iPhone devices. For more information about this, you can visit OSHA's website directly, which is listed on this slide. And then who is most at risk for heat stress? Uh, workers who are 65 years of age or older, are overweight, have heart disease or high blood pressure, or take medications that may be affected by extreme heat. Um, so according to the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, um, they are the most at risk. So when is hot too hot? Um, OSHA's marker is at 80 degrees currently. However, it is important to check for all of the following besides the temperature. Um, so if you have increased humidity, strong sun, no air movement, no controls in place to reduce the impact of equipment that radiates heat, employees wearing improper clothing for the weather, or some strenuous, strenuous activities being performed, um, those are all things to look out for. Uh, so now I would like to turn it back over to Shelby for a poll. We're gonna do uh, just a quick question. There was one thing during Adam's portion that we really wanna emphasize uh, so give everyone a chance.
chance to weigh in and see if see if everyone was listening. So for OSHA's temperature, for a, what makes it a high heat priority day or a heat priority day, is it triggered at 75 degrees, 80 degrees, 85 degrees, or 90 degrees? Give everybody a chance to wave. Got some different ideas on this. Okay, go ahead and close it so we can get moving on. And yeah, it looks like most people had a B for 80 degrees. Jay, what's the correct answer on that? Well, the correct answer, Shelby, would be B, 80 degrees. That that would be a heat priority day occurs when the heat index for that day is expected to be 80 degrees or more. <clears throat> All right, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the various types of heat stress that affect the human body. There are about, there are, there are four of them. Uh, there's heat stroke, which is the most serious type of heat stress. There's heat exhaustion, heat cramps, and heat rash, heat, excuse me, heat rash, which is the, the least severe of the four types of heat stress. Uh, first one I'd like to talk about a little bit about would be heat stroke. Um, heat stroke is a life-threatening condition and a medical emergency if it, if it occurs to an employee. Uh, the main cause of heat stroke is the body's core temperature rises to very dangerous levels. Um, some of the symptoms of heat stroke include dry, hot, reddish skin, lack of sweating, which is kind of hard to believe, as, as hot as you, you would be, uh, high body temperatures, strong rapid pulse, chills, confusion, and uh, slurred speech. The next form of heat stress is heat exhaustion. Um, heat exhaustion occurs when the blood moves towards the, your outer extremities, your arms, your legs, and to remove the heat away from your brain. Uh, a variety of symptoms for heat exhaustion include uh, excessive sweating, weakness or fatigue, dizziness, confusion, clammy skin, muscle cramps, and uh, flushed complexion. The uh, next form of heat stress that a body can incur are heat cramps. Uh, typically heat cramps occur due to excessive water loss from your body, uh, sweating and dehydration. And some of the symptoms of heat, uh, heat cramps include uh, muscle pain, usually in the abdomen, arms, and legs, and muscle spasms in the uh, abdomen, arms, and legs. And the uh, last form of heat, heat stress is heat rash. And it's typically the most common type of heat stress the body can incur, and usually the uh, least severe of the four. Um, and it basically occurs when sweat cannot freely evaporate from your skin. And some symptoms of heat rash would be uh, red clusters or of pimples or small blisters, and they usually occur uh, in your neck, your upper chest, your groin, under your breasts, and in the elbow areas, uh, elbow creases. Typically where, where the sun doesn't shine is where you could get a heat rash. All right. Always have a very good way of explaining things, Jay. Um, do one more quick question just to emphasize. So what heat stress is the deadliest? We've got the heat rash, B, heat stroke, B, heat cramps, D, heat exhaustion. Which one of these four would be the most deadliest of them? Looks like everybody's coming in in pretty good agreement, but we'll see if it's correct. We'll go ahead and close it out. Looks like 100% of those voted said B, heat stroke. Uh, Greg, what's your correct answer on that? I would agree. As Jay mentioned, heat stroke is the deadliest. All right, next slide. All right, now that we know what heat stress is and how one can reduce the occurrence of heat-related injuries, 
uh, we've all known or been that person that has uh, been out there working even harder than they should, knowing that the, they start to show signs of heat stress. I know I've been one of those before in my younger days. Uh, so what can we do to help help protect those individuals? Uh, for, for these people, someone needs to identify the signs and guide that person to aid. Uh, and what will be done uh, is the following categories that OSHA dictates. They contain the engineering practice controls, administrative and work practice, training, personnel protective equipment and clothing, health screening, acclimatization, and next slide. Engineering controls are the action of modifying the work environment to eliminate or reduce the hazard that is present in that environment. Engineering controls can be more costly up front, but could be more economically friendly after years of use doing, due to eliminating the hazard. Uh, this is done by reducing the need for PPE or other controls due to the hazard not being there anymore. This can be done by adding additional air conditioning to provide cooler air in those areas, increase ventilation as far as uh, adding more cool air, taking away more hot air, in installing cooling fans or portable um, misting equipment to help cool the workers in those more uh, uh, out of reach areas. Exhaust ventilation in the cooking, uh, kitchen cooking exhaust system, laundry vents for dryers, ducts, for other heat producing items like boilers. Uh, these systems are effective in taking away the heat and with uh, some bringing in cooler air. You can install shields uh, used, to, used to reflect radiant heat produced by a piece of equipment that could be placed in between the worker and that piece of equipment. Uh, installation of insulation in equipment rooms that have high heat producing equipment. Also fixing leaking steam or other um, heat related piping components as well can help reduce um, heat related injuries. And you can also install temporary or permanent shades in those outdoor areas uh, to help assist in that. Administrative and work practice controls are policies developed and implemented by management and owner group. Uh, examples are scheduling jobs that are not continuous operations uh, to, be, to be completed at cooler times of the day when possible. Uh, for example, moving items from a hot storage room could be done uh, in the morning or night when it's a lot cooler. Um, an example of routine and annual maintenance. Uh, can be completed during cooler seasons, scheduled to be uh, completed during those seasons that are a lot cooler. And while we know it's hard to find employees in, in the industry, if it's possible to have relief workers to allow others to take breaks to cool down uh, with less of an impact to the operations, it can help uh, help workers cool down and have less heat related injuries. You can also install work rest schedules, uh, varies based off the temperature and the work environment, clothing worn, and uh, type of work that's performed. Training controls. This is the foundation for an effective program. An employee may begin to feel signs of heat stress building before other employees can recognize them occurring. This is why it's important to train all employees and re-educate employees over time to assure they are refreshed on their roles and how to prevent injuries. Uh, the following topics should include hazards, uh, and how heat stress impacts the body, how to avoid heat-related injuries through the use of PPE, administrative controls, and health screenings, recognize the signs and symptoms, and to be on the lookout for others with those symptoms. Also, uh, what should be taken is what actions should the employee uh, use when they find these signs. Also included should be first aid procedures as well as um, how to notify first responders if needed. And what the employee program is doing to address heat related illnesses as well. Now PPE and clothing, uh, they do nothing to eliminate the hazard in the workplace. There's still heat, high heat in those areas. They just help protect the worker, uh, help cool them down and uh, maintain their body, their core temperature. Uh, examples are hats, um, outdoors, for outdoor sun protection, 
those and and even those in that have uh, a ventilation to allow heat to dissipate through the head quicker are good options. Loose clothing that can deflect radiant heat away from the body. There's also an increase in cooling clothing that can assist in cooling core temperature. There's uh, dermal patches. Uh, these are a good option. They have a visual representation of the individual's core temperature that can be seen by the person and also others in the area. Um, this could indicate when someone would need to be removed from the area and uh, fix the heat related injury before it happens. Heart rate monitors may sound expensive, but today, with today's technology and the rapid rise in smart watches, uh, employees may already be wearing one. If not, there's a wide range of options out there on the market. OSHA recommends a sustained heart rate of 180 beats per minute, minus the age of the individual during the peak work effort. The recovery rate of the individual should be 120 beats per minute after the peak work rate. Heat stroke and heat exhaustion increase heart rates, as Jay mentioned. Remember, PPE does not eliminate the hazard in the environment, but also helps protect the employee when working in the high heat area. All right, on to health screening and acclimatization. Uh, new hires should be staggered with 20% or so of the normal workload and gradually increase load over seven to 14 days. Uh, this just helps them get used to that temperature and uh, help reduce those heat related injuries. Also employees that have been off work for some weeks may also need reacclimated to the work environment. And advised workers that certain medicine can increase risk. Examples are amphetamines, diuretics, and antihistamines may lead to increase in heat stress, as well as legal drug use such as amphetamines are particularly hazardous when heat stress is present to employees. Also, advise workers to check with their doctors if they have any questions. Uh, please note the employer is not entitled to know whether workers have these conditions, but only whether workers have any conditions that limit their ability to perform their job duties. In other instances, workers with chronic conditions may need extra time to become acclimated or may need other accommodations, such as more frequent breaks or restricted work. So encourage workers to consult with the doctor or pharmacist if they have any questions about whether they are at risk, increased risk for heat-related illness because of health conditions they have or medications they may take. All right, it's a lot of good information. It's, it's a great program from OSHA, but as with everything OSHA, it is complicated. There's a whole lot to it. So we've attached the, uh, in the handouts the OSHA National Emphasis Program in full. So if you want to save that, um, you should be able to save it on the handout. That way you can kind of go through it, and pick it apart and get a little more information about it. Um, we also have attached our society insurance. Uh, we have a one page working in hot conditions handout that's good if you want to give it to your employees just as, as a quick overview that they can they can read through about working in the hot conditions. Um, we also have our blogs. Uh, if, if you go to societyinsurance.com under the blogs, there's three specifically on this subject. Um, there's tons of others, lots of resources there, but just wanted to direct you to those three just because they were related to this specific topic. Uh, now we'll see if Anybody has any questions? I've had two or three come in so far. You can go ahead and add them uh, now if you haven't yet. Uh, first one is, uh, oh, asking about the OSHA app. Adam, you referred to the OSHA app early on. Uh, they want to know if the app is free or not. Uh, yeah, so at this time, uh, it is free on both app stores. Um, so again, at this time, that might that might change, but I don't really foresee that changing. So. Yeah, they are both free at this time. Good question. Okay. Um, this one, Greg, I think this probably fits into your area. Uh, what type of controls are most effective at eliminating heat hazards? You had mentioned that you, you can't eliminate the heat, but what's most effective at controlling the hazards? Yeah, engineering controls are the best option. Uh, they typically can reduce the heat in that area by modifying any of the situation that's present. So engineering is the best, but it may take several uh, controls to help reduce that hazard. Okay, so a lot of those physical controls that try to control it. And um, can a person have heat exhaustion and heat stroke? 
So it sounds like they're asking if they can have heat exhaustion and heat stroke both at the same time, and that kind of lands in Jay's territory. Jay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I, I am. I am not a doctor, but uh, yes, you can have heat exhaustion and heat stroke at the same time. Um, if if an if someone gets heat exhaustion and it, it's not taken care of, it can rapidly progress into heat stroke, which is a deadly form of heat stress to, to the body. Right. That is all I see on there. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Hope there was some good information. Hope you grabbed that handout uh, for the OSHA program. So you have that for reference. Um, for those of you who'd like to learn more about Society Insurance, uh, you can always go visit societyinsurance.com. There's a whole lot of resources under the Risk Control tab that can help you in this area and a whole lot of other areas. So thanks again for joining us. Look forward to seeing everybody for the next webinar and hope everyone has a good day.